Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the word. I'm Barry Bryson, and uh, we're closing our study of Thessalonian correspondence today by just thinking about some of the large lessons that we've learned um, in these letters. Now, when we introduced the letters, we said that First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians are two of the earliest, perhaps even the earliest parts of the New Testament to be written. They are very early. Um, um, and um, therefore, they have such primitive value for us when we think about what Paul did, because he talks a lot about this. this is the way I acted when I was among you, and this is what we taught you as of first importance. It's also important, not just because it's early, period, but because it's early in the history of the congregation. Because as we read Acts chapter 16 and 17, we know that he only got to spend a few weeks in Thessalonica before he was bounced out of there by his Jewish persecutors, and he had to move on to Berea. And which he writes about in the in First Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians, he's newly out of Macedonia. He's in Athens. He's worried about them, and he sends Timothy back to see how they're doing, and he writes this letter to them when Timothy's come back and made his report, because he's, A, so happy that they're doing well, and B, because they have questions they want to answer. And so it has such wonderful historical value to us for, for those reasons. Um, and so we have these two categories um, of, of, um, of um, study um, that will help us in our understanding of New Testament Christianity and also of mission work. One is Paul's method. And, and Paul writes a lot about his method in both First and Second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And he makes clear that when he was there, he worked. He was a vocational missionary. Um, and, and he did that not because um, he didn't deserve to be supported while he worked on them, but because he was going to be there for a short time and he needed to set them an example. And so we see Paul acting as a vocational missionary. This was something he usually did. Um, uh, there were other places, like when he was at Ephesus, that the work got so successful and got so big so quickly, and he was there so long that he rented a lecture hall and really lived there, not so much as a tent maker, a leather worker, but as a teacher. But when he was in Thessalonica, everybody knew his work ethic. Everybody knew that he didn't take a penny from anyone and that he uh, supported himself uh, while he was there. Um, we, we, also, we also learned something of, of his demeanor. He didn't come in bullying people, bossing people, pretending to be the big shot. He said, I was a nursemaid. I was a mother as we birthed this church. You know, I took care of you tenderly. Um, and so we know something about his tone of voice and his demeanor when he was there, which doesn't mean he didn't talk about the end and judgment because he did. In fact, all of their questions revolve around the second coming and their misunderstanding of it because he made it so clear. He imprinted it so clearly in their consciousness that Jesus is coming soon that, that they, when they didn't have him there in the moment to ask questions, started to get some wrong impressions and then started to follow some of them down the wrong path. In First Thessalonians, they're worried about people who die before the second coming that they'll miss out. He has to address that. In Second Thessalonians, you have people who think, well, it's coming so soon, I can just quit my job and wait for that to happen. And he has to address that. Um, and, um, and so we, we understand some of the primary teaching and how the, the second coming was such a central part of it, preparing for the second coming of Jesus and how imminent it was in Paul's mind and how imminent he made it in their minds. We shouldn't be surprised at this. I mean, he doesn't even finish his sermon in Acts 17. In Athens, right after he's been in Thessalonica, before he gets to the judgment at the end. I mean, and his sermon doesn't get a finish. It's interrupted. So we know this is part of his primary teaching when he's given one shot to speak to those smart guys on the Areopagus. You know, he goes straight to the, resur to the resurrection of the dead and the judgment. Um, so, yes, his demeanor was that of a mother, of a parent, nurturing their children, 
but he was sharing the truth about the about the second coming. We also understand why they were successful, even though they were so young, and what Paul has emphasized. Uh, and in chapter one, remember those things that we noticed that they had clearly turned from idols to serve a living God. They were truly converted. So there's one thing. Another thing is they loved each other. And he mentions this throughout both. You love each other. No one needs to tell you. The love that you have has gone forth in the brotherhood. They loved each other. So they were converted. They loved each other. And they were working and serving. And he mentions that over and over again. How you were, and, and he began immediately raising money from those Thessalonian, from, me, from those Macedonian churches. And he raised more than even they were able to give. I mean, their, their, their heart of service was so large. He, he talks about it in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uses them as an example, uh, how they gave more than they could. So there's that. There's conversion, love, service, and expectation. They were expectant, waiting for, for the second coming, waiting for, for, for him to return. And so we know that those are the... Uh, those are the essential elements of a successful congregation. We've got some really solid instruction about living our lives in those short verses at the end of chapter three. If you don't work, you don't eat. That you you, you need to be occupied. That there's that occupation work is not the curse, and that there was occupation in the garden, and and, and we're, we're intended to live productive lives. Uh, we we are we are saved by grace through faith for good works which God prepared beforehand for us, Ephesians uh, chapter 2. So so we learned that. We learned that if someone is disruptive or idle, we recognize that. We see it and we name it and we avoid it. That's not punitive, remember? That's not punitive. That is protective of the body and restorative of the person, or hopefully it will be. We're not to treat them like an enemy but like a brother that we're trying to restore. Uh, so many more things. I've already taken nearly eight minutes of your time. Um, but um, I, I hope that you'll go back over and over again. I do. First and second Thessalonians, just to remind me of basic Christian teaching that is essential above all else. And then first and second Timothy and Titus, because that's my job. <laughs> because he's writing to young ministers. I'm not a young minister, but I have, still have much to learn. So I hope you'll go back over and over again to First and Second Thessalonians and just reestablish yourself um, in, on, in the foundation that Paul laid at that church that was such a joy to him and such a successful congregation. Well, what are we going to study next? I thought we'd study resurrection accounts, and I'll introduce that next time resurrection accounts the raising of the dead old and new testament and uh, we'll take a couple of weeks to look through those i hope that's interesting to you and we'll pick up there next time thank you for joining me for another five good minutes